Good afternoon. Welcome to our eighth uh, webinar on food digestion, the InfoGest webinar. Um, welcome from a still lockdown uh, Ireland. My name is Andre Broadkop. I'm uh, based in the Chagas Food Research Center at home, obviously now. Uh, I'm joined by an all-female uh, group of panelists and speakers. Uh, if you can show yourself, please. Um, there's uh, Lottie Egger from the Agoscope in Switzerland. Isida Recio from the CL in Madrid in Spain. We are joined by uh, Annabel Mule Cabero from the Quadrum Institute in the UK and uh, Gail Bornhorst all the way from California, early morning California. Uh, and of course, as usual, um, Mern Egan is working in the background doing the magic of their webinar and is edit editing the uh, recording for uploading to the YouTube channel. So today's uh, theme uh, is in vitro digestion models. Our second webinar, uh, which is also on YouTube, uh, has covered an introduction to the food uh, digestion and also the uh, uh, static in vitro digestion model, the InfoGest model. And today we are going a little bit uh, more sophisticated. Gail will uh, cover dynamic models and uh, uh, Annabelle will cover the semi-dynamic semi uh, uh, digestion model. So uh, without any further delay, I will hand over to, uh, to Lottie, who will introduce the first speaker. So the webinar is just one hour long, two speakers, uh, a couple of announcements at the end, and Lottie will also uh, uh, give an announcement uh, on a ring trial. So uh, uh, please wait for that. Lottie. So hello, everybody from snowy Switzerland, and uh, I would like to present you Gail Bornhorst. She is an associate professor at the University of California in Davis in the Department of Biological and Agricultural Engineering and Food Science and Technology. Her overall research area is the understanding of structural breakdown during digestion and the development of dynamic digestion models. Good afternoon, I'm Dr. Gail Bornhorst, and today I'm going to talk to you about dynamic digestion models, challenges, uses, and opportunities. Before we get started, I'd really like to thank Andre for inviting me to speak in this webinar today. It's really great that the InfoGest group has continued to have these webinars, especially because we haven't been able to meet in person for a while now. So as we've already seen in the first seminar, <clears throat> the digestion process is really complex. And I just like to remind you of some of the complexities as we build on the story we're going to talk about today. So we start in the mouth, we break down our foods, mix them with saliva, they go through our esophagus to our stomach. In our stomach, they're mixed with acids, enzymes are physically broken down, they go to our intestines, small intestines for absorption, and large intestines for fermentation, followed by excretion. But still keeping in mind that each of these different digestion steps has a combination of both physical and chemical processes. And so this is what we're gonna talk about today. So to orient you a little bit to the key processes of gastric digestion so you can understand better why we want to incorporate some of these factors in our dynamic models, I'm going to give you a brief overview to make sure we're all on the same page. So if you see in our diagram here, our esophagus is shown in purple, our stomach is shown in pink, and the small intestine is shown in gray. Now, as we consume a meal, which is shown here in green, our meal is going into that distal or bottom part of the stomach and it layers those particles one on top of the next and after we consume our meal our gastric secretions begin. Now there's some amount of fasting gastric juice that's already in the stomach that I didn't show here but as after we've consumed a meal we have these gastric secretions heavily being added to our meal and mixed in with the aid of our peristaltic gastric contractions. So in that distal or bottom part of the stomach, we also have these peristaltic or sinusoidal type of contractions. They're acting to mix our meal together, but in a very gentle way, as well as to crush and grind and break down our food particles. So now as our food particles are emptied, you can see here that they're moving into the small intestine in a process called gastric emptying. So gastric emptying is essentially how the material is leaving the stomach. Now both our gastric emptying and our gastric secretions are impacted by the gastric digestive properties. So some of those properties might include pH and buffering capacity, which are very likely to impact the gastric secretions as the secretions are um, being secreted in response to the gastric pH, the particle size and rheological properties, 
are likely to impact the emptying. So if particles are really big or the consistency is very thick, the meal isn't going to empty from the stomach very quickly, or you might have some negative feedback mechanisms. And also the composition of the foods will impact all the above properties. So we can see that these digesta properties are really indicative of our gastric breakdown. So the gastric breakdown process is linked to all these digesta properties, which are also linked to the gastric processing properties. So you can see that all these factors are interrelated to each other. So how the stomach responds to a meal is impacted by the meal, but the meal is also impacted by the stomach's response. So it becomes very complex very quickly. But let's just focus in on digestive properties and digestive breakdown. So if we look at physical breakdown during gastric digestion, there are two key types of breakdown that we typically would look at. The first is just dissolution, where you have a food matrix that slowly absorbs water and slowly or quickly dissolves and doesn't really need any physical breaking down to end up as a dissolved <coughs> um, material. But then in the contrary, we also have these peristaltic contractions. So you can see in this video an ex vivo pig stomach that is exhibiting these peristaltic contraction waves. And these contractions are what actually act in combination with our acids and, and enzymes to physically break down these solid food matrices, especially those that don't just dissolve very easily. So as I hope you've been convinced now, food breakdown is a combination of both physical and chemical processes. So how do those contractions interact with our matrix to transform our cooked food, so our noodles or our white rice, into our digesta, which ends up being a non-homogeneous viscous mass of particles mixed with gastric secretions. But why is it important in terms of these outcomes that we're looking for? Well, first, our breakdown is going to impact the gastric emptying rate. So as I mentioned to you before, the particle size and the rheological properties of the digesta will impact the gastric emptying rate which is important to understand for satiety because some studies have shown that the longer foods stay in your stomach, you will feel fuller for longer, although this is a complex mechanism modulated also by other hormonal responses. And then another thing that's really critical to think about is the nutrient delivery rate to the intestines. So we heard about this already, that this nutrient delivery rate is very important, which will in some part be controlled by the gastric emptying. So understanding these kinetics, both of the breakdown and of the emptying process, are really, really critical. So when we think about the breakdown, we also want to link that with our nutrient release. So the bioaccessibility and bioavailability of nutrients have, are linked with how fast they're delivered to the small intestine and the state at which the matrix arrives there, if it's a larger particle or if it's totally dissolved, broken down already. The kilocalorie absorption has also been shown in foods that have very rigid matrix structure and have nutrients encapsulated inside of cells like almonds to be linked with that amount of breakdown during the first phases of digestion. In addition, it can be important to consider if you're looking at something as a prebiotic or how it might impact the microbiome, the state of those particles when they get to the large intestine will be critical. So I think we can see that not only the kinetics but also the delivery location are important. So it's really critical to understand both the breakdown process and the rate at which that process occurs. So if gastric breakdown is really important, how do we study it? One way would just be to take samples from people. So in a historical case back in the 1800s, Dr. William Beaumont in Michigan in the US actually had a patient who had a permanent stoma in his stomach from a bayonet wound, and he used this patient to study digestion of different foods. And these days, there's also gastric aspiration. So taking using a nasogastric tube to be able to take samples from the stomach or intestines of someone after they've consumed a meal. However, it, although you can get some digestive properties, understand some of these complex interactions, these types of methods are ethically questionable. And even if you can find volunteers, the physiological relevance is somewhat questionable as well, because if you have an ileostomy, or if you have a tube into your stomach with a bulb there taking samples out, may not really be representative of the physio physiological process. So as an alternative, <clears throat> recent non-invasive methods such as magnetic resonance imaging and wireless capsule sensors have been utilized to get a lot of really great information that we actually need to keep moving this forward and to help the development of these in vitro models. So things like magnetic resonance imaging can tell you about emptying, motility, secretions, large-scale structures like creaming that's shown there, 
but they can't see things on a very small time scale or a very small length scale due to equipment limitations at this time, but maybe in the future they will. Wireless capsule sensors are great to tell you information about pressure and pH and temperature and even get some cool pictures and videos, but they're limited by the location at which they actually are because you can't control and you don't really know very precisely. And it's also you're limited by the resources and you don't get any properties from that. You can also take blood and plasma analysis, which is great to understand the absorption of different compounds. However, although you can get an endpoint measurement from these plasma analyses, you don't see anything in between. But we want to unravel what happens from our food from the time that we eat it to the time that it comes into our blood. And so to, to, to unravel that middle part, that's where we've turned to these in vitro models. So we've already heard about static and semi-dynamic models in the last talk, so I'm not going to focus on them here. I'm going to focus in on dynamic models. So recently, several dynamic in vitro model systems have been developed, a few of which are shown here, and they all have similar characteristics that have some type of physical forces applied. They have variations in mixing and transit time, and they typically have some type of gastric secretions going in and material emptied throughout the process to simulate in a more realistic way the physio physiological relevance of the digestion process. So when we're setting up some of these models, what are some of the factors we should think about? Some of the key factors that we want to control in these in vitro models are first looking at the mechanical movement. We want to understand the contraction rate, if that contraction rate is the same for different foods or not. We want to understand the pH profile, whether we're having a constant pH profile, which is commonly done, or whether there's a more physiologically relevant way to control the pH profile to be able to mimic some of the variations we've observed in vivo, because that will very clearly impact the enzymes and the breakdown of the matrix. We want to understand the gastric emptying and how do we control this gastric emptying. In many in vitro models, we do a constant rate of emptying, so we say a certain amount of material is emptied over a certain time. However, in the stomach, your stomach doesn't wait each 30, it doesn't have a timer that opens up the pylorus and lets out 100 grams each 30 minutes. Um, it gradually empties material over time. But due to practical reasons, many in vitro models don't use this model. So is there a way we can improve here? And also there's the gastric volume. In most of our in vitro models, there are comp they're built to accommodate a certain volume, which is what we can put in. But in our stomach, we can have a small meal, it still functions normally, but we can also have a big meal and our stomach will expand to accommodate that volume but it's still not really clear how, whether that impacts the d dynamics of the digestion process. If your stomach is really stretched out after you ate that huge meal, does that impact the diffusion of your gastric secretions into your meal? Does it impact the mixing? Does it impact the pH distribution, the overall properties, the emptying rate? It's likely that it does, but we don't really know all those connections yet. And so in many of the in vivo systems, we see those things start in blue there, that there's a certain way that these processes are controlled. In contrast, in our in vitro models, we've done things in a certain way, sometimes because it's easier, or more feasible, but other times because we just don't have the data we need to be able to set up a reliable system that makes sense for all different food products. There are a lot of challenges actually in developing these dynamic in vitro models because our physiological systems are really complex and we need to get more information in general from the in vivo systems that link these digestion parameters to foods because the closer we want to bring our in vivo models to some type of reality or to be able to really simulate the differences we see between different foods in vivo, we need to have that complementary information and quantitative information to be able to better develop these models. So, now that I've given you some challenges and how it's difficult to develop these models, it's still possible. So I'm going to show you an example of a dynamic in vitro model that we have in our lab at UC Davis. So here's our human gastric simulator. And in this model, you can see the blue liner is meant to be the stomach. And we have in there a meal of diced carrots, which you can see in orange. And these rollers are moving at a contraction rate of approximately three per minute. And you can change them due to a variable speed motor. So once our meal goes in, we have secretions that are pumped in at a certain flow rate. Um, we have our temperature control, the 37 Celsius, which is not shown in this video, but it's done with a heat lamp. And then we take our sample from the bottom. Um, our simulated pylorus is essentially a tube at the bottom of our gastric compartment that we open the tube up at each digestion time and take out a certain mass of material using a scale underneath. So I've told you already that gastric breakdown is really important. 
but can we utilize these dynamic models that we have developed, albeit with some limitations, to understand the gastric breakdown mechanisms of different foods? So here we're going to look at a small case study looking at whey protein isolate gels of varying size and shape. So we will look at 20% whey protein gels that were heated at 90 Celsius for an hour and were made into four different sizes and shapes to see the impact of size and shape of different products on their breakdown in during dynamic gastric digestion. And we had small cubes, which are about the size you would get after mastication. So they're about three millimeters. We took their specific surface area, divided it in half, ended up with our medium size, divided that in half again to get our large cubes. So we have cubes of three different sizes and spheres of a similar size to our medium cubes, but with a different specific surface area because of their geometry. So again, we use our human gastric simulator. We have our temperature control. So it's 37 Celsius, um, three contractions per minute. And in this case, our meal was 220 grams of whey protein isolate gels mixed with 0.2 milliliters per gram saliva. And then once our ga gastric digestion began, we had our secretion rate. So we use gastric juice at actually a pH of 0.8 because there have been a number of in vivo studies that have suggested that the gastric secretion pH is actually quite low, even though the meal pH, as we've seen in our last seminar, does increase quite a lot and slowly drops back down. The gastric secretion pH is actually much lower than that, but due to the buffering effects of the meal, that's what leads to this gradual pH decrease. And we also have a constant rate of gastric emptying. So we have 4.5 milliliters per minute, which essentially, which ended up to be each 30 minutes, we would take 135 milliliters or approximately 135 grams of sample from that bottom part of our HGS. And that would be a combination of gastric fluids as well as solid particles. So to quantify the solid food breakdown in this study, we took our empty digesta, we dispersed the particles um, on a light box, took images, processed those images to binarize them, and then used image processing algorithms to quantify the surface area of each of those particles. So we could look at the different size distribution after different digestion times. The first thing, since we were talking about secretions, I wanna show you the gastric digesta pH. So even though we used our gastric fluids that had a very low pH, lower than what's commonly used in many in vitro models, you can still see that this does not result in a super fast decrease of the gastric pH, but rather that slow and gradual decrease that we typically see down to about pH of 1.5 over three, a three hour period. So let's take a look at the breakdown mechanisms. So to quantify our breakdown, here's an example from the empty digester from small cubes. So in this graph here, we're looking at the histogram showing our percentage of total area on the y-axis with a particle size or particle area on the x-axis. And this is before digestion. So we can see here we have a unimodal distribution that's centered at around 20 millimeters squared um, for our small cubes. Now, after 30 minutes of digestion, we see that we have a lot of particles that are really small. So most of our particles are five millimeters squared or less. So they're very, very small, which suggests that our, our, our cubes broke apart into many small pieces, that they didn't just erode and they didn't just break up a little bit, they really broke into a lot of small pieces with a few intact ones, but mostly broke down a lot. But then if we look at longer digestion time, so we look at three hours, we see a similar distribution to what we did at the beginning of before digestion, but it just shifted slightly to the left, which is what you would imagine would happen if the particles were eroded. Right, So you would have something similar in size to what you started with, but just the edges were worn off and they were just worn down a little bit. And so this is actually a really interesting approach that you can use a pretty simple method to be able to quantify some of these mechanisms of breakdown that will help you understand both the emptying rate as well as how these nutrients will be released from the matrices. So if we take a look at all of our treatments together, we have in the rows, we first start before digestion, 30 minutes digestion, and three hours of digestion. And our columns, we see our small, medium cubes, spheres, and our large cubes. Interestingly, for all three of our, our particles that were in the shape of a cube, we see they fractured at the first 30 minutes, so they had a lot of small particles early on. But at later time points, they actually were breaking down by erosion. So after it seems that when they first went in, a lot of the pieces were broken apart in the pylorus right away, a lot of edges broken off. But once that happened, the breakdown was much more, occurred at a much slower rate. However, for spheres, we never saw this rapid breakdown, tons of small particles. They were always kind of breaking down 
through an erosion-like process. This is actually really interesting because we can see the size and shape of these whey protein gels actually impacted their breakdown, where cubes were first fragmented followed by erosion, and spheres were only eroded through the entire digestion process. And this is really important to think about because this will impact a lot our nutrient delivery rate. And now also just as a reminder, these physical, the physical breakdown aspect of the gastric digestion model is needed to observe these mechanisms. That if we were to do the same experiment using a static model, and we've done similar ones in our lab where you put these type of gels in a static system, you will just find that after a long digestion time, they don't really change that much. You don't see a dissolution, a breakdown. This breakdown we've observed here is really due to the gastric contractions in our dynamic model. So now that we know that dynamic models can help us understand breakdown mechanisms, what next? What are the opportunities both for development of these dynamic models as well as use of dynamic in vitro models? Well, first, if we're trying to develop more sophisticated dynamic models, one thing that I think is a really big opportunity is refining the pH and gastric secretion control, which is an active area we're working on in my lab. So in those two pictures there, you can see different gastric pH distributions from an in vivo study that show different meals have both a different distribution over time, but also within the stomach. So can we actually refine this pH control to say control our secretion rate based on our pH? It's also very important to look at the gastric empty control. So how can we refine the differences between meals and modulate this solid emptying? It will be important to understand and study realistic gastric wall materials that are both flexible and have the morphology of the gastric tissue as well as these adaptive relaxation mechanisms, in addition to understanding the impacts of other, um, of other components of the gastric secretion such as mucin, as you can see in these images, which plays a prominent role during in vivo digestion but isn't widely used in in vitro models, but can impact the particle wall interactions, the digestive viscosity, the particle-particle interactions, and so may play a really important role in the digestion process. And finally, I think it will be interesting to understand more type of personalized models, not necessarily for each person, but to look at other disease states, different medications, such as acid suppressing medications that change your gastric secretions, to understand how we can develop dynamic models that mimic these conditions to be able to develop targeted products for certain segments of the population. So I think these are kind of self-explanatory, these opportunities for use of dynamic models that we really want to understand these food breakdown mechanisms so we can design specific food structures to have that breakdown rate that we want depending on the outcome, whether it's a fast delivery or a slow delivery, and we'll be able to use this for new product screening. In addition, we can help increase our knowledge of food breakdown in different population groups, such as different age groups, disease states, medications that alter gastric function, to really allow us to be able to develop targeted functional food products for specific segments of the population. So with that, um, I have to acknowledge all the students in my group, especially Dr. Yamile Managovela, whose work on the whey protein gels I talked to you about, and all of my students for making it such a great team in our lab. So with that, I thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you, Gail, for the very, very interesting uh, presentation. So as you can see in the chat, we have several questions. Um, one of the questions is um, regarding the, how do you come uh, for the gastrin emptying rate of uh, 4.5 milliliter material per mm, milliliter per minute? Yeah, that's how a great question about the it? gastric emptying rate. Um, so the reason, so the gastric emptying is a little bit tricky in some of these models where we have solids and liquids because we don't have this kind of homogeneous mass to come up with. So actually in designing this study, we went in and looked into the literature to look for kind of similar meals, also high in protein that estimated an emptying rate and the average, and I was double checking this actually as we were, as, as the presentation was going on. Um, but yeah, the average of a handful of in vivo studies showed that they, they had reported an emptying rate of around 4.5 milliliter, milliliters per minute, 4.5 grams per minute. Um, and so that's what we assumed. And in, because I didn't have time to show, uh, I didn't show that, but we also looked at the actual, the emptying rate of solids and emptying rate of protein during, um, during the digestion. So you can see that there are some differences um, between the different meals. And again, that 4.5 milliliters material per minute is 
making this assumption that we, we can't control in this dynamic model how much solid is coming out versus how much gastric fluid. And we know it's not homogeneous. Um, so again, that's, that's an assumption, but I think it's, it's one we have to make, even though I think as, as I, kind of I said in the talk, there are a lot of opportunities to really improve on how we modulate this emptying rate, especially for solids where it's harder to even estimate a kilocalories per minute because it's hard to know what you're actually even getting out of your model. Uh, thank you for the interesting talk concerning the breakdown of whey protein gels. Do you have any additional information on the proteolysis? Do you sample at the bottom of the stomach? And do you see any phase separation liquids versus semi-solids? Uh, we do have information on the proteolysis, which I just didn't present because of the time. And we do sample at the bottom. So essentially in our dynamic model, we have like our stomach gastric reactor where samples, we put our samples in at the top, the gastric secretions are going in there and we're sampling from the bottom, like our simulated pylorus. So our samples coming out are, are just representing those right at the bottom that should be the most broken down, like what would be getting emptied from the stomach. We don't take, we don't stop and take out the entire thing that's in the stomach. We just sample, we sample dynamically from the bottom from our entire meal, like over time. And so we do have information on the proteolysis. Um, and there is, there's definitely, in this case, there was definitely a phase separation between the solid particles that would settle out. And then there are some suspended solids in the gastric fluids. Um, and the amount of phase separation you see really depends on the type of meal. These whey protein gels were actually pretty, uh, you could differentiate them pretty easily from the gastric fluids, but we've done other dynamic digestions with things such as like chickpeas or crackers or other snack products where you do kind of end up with this semi-solid paste that only will separate out if you centrifuge it and then you'll get your solids and suspended solids and liquids. Okay, there are questions from George Van Aken who is working in uh, silico modeling. Oh, so he is asking if you think that we can align actions so in FIFO, with this advance in fetal digestion models, what is your opinion on this? And also, if you think that the gel breakdown can be uh, mathematically modeled. Uh, I think in theory, hopefully, hopefully it could be. Um, but the process, I think, is more complex once you start actually taking a look at the data and the the type of samples that you're that you're getting out to just to have a mathematical model. If 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 it was a straightforward answer to do a mathematical model to to describe the breakdown, it would be done, I think. But it's it is really complex because even in the study where we just had different shapes and sizes, we saw different breakdown patterns, different types of particle areas after digestion, and that's only considering what we were emptying from our stomach, not even what's completely in the stomach. Um, and so we're in in other projects in our lab, we are trying to describe to come up with ways to better model these processes. Um, but it's complex because you're not just taking, it's not just one particle experiencing a certain condition and breaking down a certain way. It's many particles and they all interact with each other as well as the wall and then also the gastric fluids. Um, so I think it's, it's for sure something that is interesting and we should continue to look more in this area, but it's not, uh, it's not so straightforward as some other processes. And also for sure, I think it would be interesting to try to connect some of these pieces together um, from different dynamic models with in vivo information to develop these more advanced in silico and computational models. Um, but I think it's a big, it's a big challenge because a lot of the computational models, uh, if they're really high resolution, like the uh, fluid flow models, particle breakdown models, they don't run for a very long amount of time because they're really computationally expensive to run those type of models. But our digestion process is occurring over hours and we're trying to look at the combination of many individual particles. So there's a, I think there's a lot of additional work we can do in these areas to really be able to develop a broad computational uh, understanding of the process. I have one very short question, Gail, and you didn't mention that. How many models, such models are there in the world? Is there a unique model? Are there one, two, three models around? And uh, is it, was it homemade? Was it when I, I don't have a understanding of when that was made, you know, that was well before my time anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the model that I showed, we have that model in our lab and it was originally homemade. It was actually an undergrad student project who did the first iteration of this and then another master's student worked to improve on it. And then we've also, several of my students have worked to, to continuously improve on it. 
And now we have another version that's very similar, that's almost the same as this improved version in New Zealand at the Institute. So this is like our kind of second generation. The first generation, they also have several of them in New Zealand um, that has a more vertical reactor that has contractions coming from the sides, which maybe some of you have seen. So that was like the first generation also developed at Davis and now they have in New Zealand. And this is our kind of, is our second generation that we have in our lab and also um, in New Zealand. But we have, we have moved it around. It went on vacation once our HGS, he went over to University of Birmingham um, when Seraphim McCallis was there and, and it, it, we actually shipped it over there to do some experiments. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, it is a world traveler, our model at this, at this point. <laughs> Okay, it like us last year, yeah? Yeah. Okay, very good. Well, thank you, Gail. Uh, thanks for the time again. I know it's uh, very early in the morning uh, in California, so you can have your second cup of coffee while we uh, move on to the next speaker. Um, next speaker is Annabelle Moulet Cabero. If you can switch on your camera, please, Annabelle. So it's a great pleasure for me to introduce uh, Annabelle uh, because I know her for many years. Um, she, uh, Annabelle, is based in the Quadrum Institute now in the UK in Norwich uh, and Annabel did a PhD with myself and Alan Mackey and Pete Wild uh, many years ago and one of the products uh, of the PhD was the development of a international consensus model, uh, a semi-dynamic model and Annabel will explain that in great detail in a way that was a uh, uh, a, there was a drive to uh, go beyond this static uh, InfoGest model uh, to have a more sophisticated model and uh, uh, a group of us uh, led by Annabelle in many ways um, uh, has just done that. So I hand over to Annabelle, it's a pre-recorded uh, talk and you can answer, uh, uh, post the question in the question and answer button at the bottom of your screen. Okay. Hello everyone. My name is Annabel Mulet Cabero, and I'm going to talk about the semi-dynamic info test that tests your model. This model was published last year in Food and Function. It is based on physiological data and it builds on the static info test model. Similarly to the static protocol, the method describes the digestion of the oral, gastric, and small intestinal phases. The oral and intestinal phases are static, but the gastric phase is dynamic. Therefore, it is closer to what happens is in vivo. But why is it important to obtain a closer simulation of the gastric phase? The volume coming from the mouth is subjected to several dynamic, biochemical and mechanical processes in the stomach. There is a continuous decrease of the pH after the consumption of a meal, as you can see in this typical pH curve of the human stomach. This acidification occurs through the secretion of hydrochloric acid until it reaches pH values of the fasted state, below pH 2. There is the gradual secretion of gastric lipase and pepsinogen, which is the precursor of pepsin. This leads to the hydrolysis of lipids and proteins. The hydrolysis of carbohydrates also occurs in the stomach since the alpha amylase from the saliva is still active in the beginning of the gastric digestion. As you can see in the graph, the different enzymes become active as the gastric chyme acidifies during time, since they have a different optimum pH range. There is limited mixing in the stomach, so it is mostly used as a storage. The chyme is exposed to a certain amount of shearing close to the exit of the stomach in the andrum, where the chyme can be grinded to particles of a smaller size and this is due to the complex peristaltic contraction waves. All these processes can contribute to the modification of the initial structure of the bolus and its physical rheological properties leading to what we call restructuring. This might also result in different colloidal behaviors such as sedimentation and creaming, as you can see in these magnetic resonance images of the stomach. These different structural changes affect gastric emptying. This is the portion of the chyme that enters from the stomach to the small intestine, which is the main site of nutrient absorption. That's why gastric phase is crucial, because it controls the rate and extent of nutrient by accessibility and subsequent absorption 
The semi-dynamic model sits between static and dynamic models. These models were already explained in the second webinar by Andre Brodkov. So just briefly, the static model means that the parameters such as pH, the ratio of potenza, ionic strength, are constant within the digestion phases, in contrast to the dynamic models. The static models are easier to use and accessible, but they do not simulate the complexity of the gastrointestinal tract, such as those dynamic processes occurring in the stomach I saw earlier. So it is relevant to estimate the endpoints value of the adhesion. In contrast, the dynamic models are less accessible, but they are a better representation of the physiological dynamics. Therefore, they can provide a more accurate description of the digestion kinetics and possible structural changes. So, this semi-dynamic model bridges the gap between these two models, with the aim of being more accessible and less expensive than the dynamic models, as well as more physiologically relevant than the static models. The semi-dynamic model simulates the progressive acidification gradual enzyme and fluid secretion, limited mixing, and continuous emptying that occurs in the gastric digestion. This provides a good representation of the possible restructuring and phase separation of foods in the stomach and the kinetics of nutrient digestion. I would like to illustrate the relevance of this model with one example, the digestion of milk proteins. I'm going to play some videos showing the gastric digestion of milk which contains 80% casein and 20% whey proteins, and the digestion of only whey proteins. This was performed using this wireless capsule camera that you can swallow before the meal and allows the recording inside your stomach. So this is how the inside of your stomach looks like. This is milk entering the stomach. And after some time, you can see this mature restructuring of milk by the formation of these clots that seem quite compact due to the coagulation of casein. These new structures were quite resistant to digestion since they were observed after more than two hours. In contrast, whey proteins form this kind of white precipitate of light consistency, and this was not persistent over time compared to the casein digestion since it could not be observed after 90 minutes. The same samples were digested using the semi-dynamic model and very similar structures were obtained, showing the strong coagulation of caseins and the partial solubility of whey proteins. The gastric behavior affected the way the nutrients, in this case proteins, are delivered from the stomach to the small intestine. The solubility of whey proteins in the stomach induce a higher and faster nutrient delivery in the first stages of gastric digestion, as you can see in red. In contrast, the strong coagulation of caseins hampered the emptying of proteins in the beginning of digestion. This was reflected in amino acids that were bioaccessible and absorbed during intestinal digestion and using an ex vivo model for absorption. Whey proteins show a greater amount of leucine being released and absorbed using the first aliquots of gastric digestion, in contrast to casein. What I wanted to illustrate in here is that the gastric behavior was the controlling mechanism for this effect. This clearly explains the contrasting behavior of these two proteins that was observed in human. The consumption of whey proteins induced a high but short increase of amino acid in plasma, in contrast to the consumption of caseins that led to a prolonged but low levels of leucine. From this study, whey proteins have been considered as fast proteins and caseins as slow protein. I would like to emphasize that not only proteins can be affected by the gastric conditions, it can also be important for the rest of the nutrients. So now that we know what the model can do, I would like to go through the semi-dynamic protocol step by step. As I mentioned, the model describes the three stages of the upper gastrointestinal tract, the oral and small intestinal phases are static and the gastric phase is dynamic. Previous to the performance of the digestion per se, 
I'm afraid there is a bit of preparation and considerations to start with. This is similar to what it needs to be done for the static protocol. The determination of enzyme activities and the preparation of electrolyte fluids are in the same way as in the static protocol, except for the adjustment of pH 7 instead of pH 3 in the gastric fluid, because we want to simulate that progressive acidification. Also, you need to know the dry weight of the sample for the oral phase and the caloric content by which the gastric emptying is calculated. A pH test needs to be performed to determine the volume and concentration of hydrochloric acid needed to decrease the pH of the tested food to pH 2. Other aspects that need to be considered are the number of gastric emptying aliquots that you want to be taken during the digestion and the way you want to perform the mixing and the emptying. I understand that this can seem a bit confusing at this point, but I hope it gets clear along the presentation. So once these parameters have been measured, they can be entered in the spreadsheet provided in the supplementary material, as in the static protocol. And this automatically calculates the amount of the remaining components, as well as the volume and the time of emptying. The oral phase procedure is very much like in the static protocol. The sample tested should represent a real meal. This means, for example, in case of low moisture foods such as bread or cheese, some dilution is needed. For solid foods, a mincer is used to simulate the chewing. The final ratio of simulated salivary fluids to food is 1 to 1. But in contrast to the static protocol, it is based on the dry weight of food, because the relation found between saliva and the dry weight of food seem more relevant. The rest of the conditions are the same as in the static protocol. Moving on to the dynamic part of the model, the gastric phase. As I said, this includes the crucial dynamic parameters of the gastric digestion. The final activities of the enzyme as well as the electrolyte concentrations are the same as in the static protocol. The difference is that these components are delivered gradually during the digestion. In the following slides, I'm going to explain how we can achieve these dynamic parameters. This is an example of a setup of the model of the gastric phase. The sample after the oral phase is placed in this vessel with a thermostat jacket, which is kept at 37 degrees using a water bath. The acidification of the sample occurs thanks to the continuous delivery of acid using a dosing device. You can use the dosing device of a pH stat, which is connected to a pH probe. Therefore, the pH inside of the reaction vessel can continuously be monitored. Alternatively, you could use a syringe pump and an external pH probe. Also, the acid solution is mixed with electrolyte gastric solution and delivered by the same dosing device. Therefore, there is a variable concentration of electrolytes as well. The volume of acid is added to reach a final pH close to 2. The in vivo rate of secretion depends on some parameters such as the consistency of the chyme. However, for simplicity, in this model, the gastric secretions are delivered in a linear rate. This is a typical pH curve in the gastric phase that can be obtained in the semidynamic model, similar to the one obtained in vivo. It also simulates the basal volume and fasting pH found below 2 by adding the 10% of the total gastric secretion. This basal volume is added in the reaction vessel before starting the gastric digestion, which lowers the pH of the bolus coming from the oral phase. After meal consumption, the pH generally increases quickly close to the pH of the meal, and this value depends on the buffering capacity of the bolus. Then the pH gradually declines to the fasted state pH by the continuous delivery of the remaining 90% of the gastric secretion, including hydrochloric acid, electrolytes, and enzymes. Just to note that the gradual emptying of chyme will also help to that pH lowering due to the reduction of the buffering capacity during digestion. 
The simulation of this pH profile is crucial for several reasons. As I mentioned, the activity of the enzymes present in the stomach varies depending on the pH, which subsequently affects the hydrolysis of the tested food. Also, some food components are susceptible to pH changes such as milk proteins, and that can change their structure and rheological properties, as I showed you before. This affects, for instance, the delivery of the nutrients and the accessibility of the enzymes to the substrate. The addition of the enzyme is performed by a dosing device such as a syringe pump. It is added separately from the previous solution with acid in order to limit their autodegradation. We recommend the use of rabbit gastric extract containing both pepsin and li gastric lipase at the same final activities as in the static infotest protocol. For simplicity, we use a linear rate of delivery. With regards to the mixing, we propose a weak mixing simulating the upper part of the stomach by the use of this orbital shaker or a paddle stirrer at low speed. And the blood cup designed these nice paddle stirrers for a cylindrical and V-shaped vessels and the files for the 3D printing can be found in the supplementary material of the article. The mixing system is a compromise between the dispersion of the digestion fluids in the reaction vessels and the possible formation of new structures and colloidal behaviors. This leads to a poor mixing of the gastric contents as it happens in in vivo. For instance, the phase separation in the stomach was shown in this study highlighting this low mixing, which contradicts the idea of intragastric homogenization of the chyme. However, this mixing does not simulate the complex peristaltic contractions waves that are responsible for the significant shear and foot grinding in the antrum. For this kind of simulation, you will have to go for dynamic models such as the DTM. Moving on to the simulation of the gastric emptying, Emptying is referred to the portion of the chyme that is delivered from the stomach to the small intestines through the pylorus. The pylorus acts as a sieve in which liquid and particles smaller than around 3 mm can pass through. The gastric emptying rate is affected by different physical properties of the chyme. However, one of the main controlling factors is the caloric density. The calculations of the resident time of this model are based on the in vivo data considering the emptying average of 2 kilocalories minute of a food volume of 500 milliliters. To keep things simple, this is performed in a linear rate, so the volume of each gastric emptying aliquot is the same. You can select the number of aliquots for the simulation of the emptying and we recommend a minimum of 3 to show kinetics. The emptying is performed stepwise from the bottom of the vessel using a selected lab tool, which can be just the tip of a pipette, with an end inner diameter of 3 mm approximately, in order to simulate that sieving of the pylorus. Moving on to the small intestinal phase, this part of the protocol remains the same as the static version and is performed individually with each aliquot that is emptying from the gastric phase. The aim is to obtain a final ratio of emptying digesta to simulated intestinal fluid of 1 to 1. The rest of the conditions are the same as in the static protocol. To conclude, I hope I convince you about the, the importance of the dynamic simulation of the gastric phase in the context of nutrient digestion kinetics. The model described is cheap because it uses parts that are usually available in a lab and it is relatively simple because it is easy to operate. So it is a tool that can be used in a wide range of laboratories. It can simulate the possible gastric restructuring and rates of digestion of foods, being therefore a suitable tool for investigating the role of food matrix. The article provides a step-by-step -step protocol example of setup and a list of apparatus that are needed as well as a spreadsheet for the calculations.
It is also important to acknowledge some of its limitations, including the shape of the reaction vessel, which does not simulate the J shape of the stomach, and also the gastric motility. Just to let you know that a ring trial about this model is being organized by Working Group 1 to examine the, the variability of this model between labs. And I'm sure that you will hear more from the group leaders soon. Finally, I would like to thank all the authors of the article and the people who contributed in the discussions of the InfoChess workshops. I would like to say that most of the results I presented today are from my PhD with a Waltz Fellowship by Chagas. And I would like to thank my supervisors back then, Andre Brodkop, Alan Mackey and Pete Wilde. Finally, many thanks to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak in this webinar and thank you very much for listening. Question I see coming in. I have, Annabelle, I have a short question, right? Yeah. Uh, so this is a semi-dynamic model and uh, you published uh, all the details, including Excel spreadsheets and all that. Is it easy to set up in a lab? Okay, well, yeah. Well, I think at the beginning you need a bit of practice. So, uh, as always, I mean, you need to, to practice a bit to get the feel of, of that and to get used to. But the, the thing of this model is that you can get um, easily the parts that we propose for the, for the setup of the model. So, series pumps or orbital shakers, I mean, they are quite accessible in all the labs. So, that's one of the important things of this, this model. And yeah, I think it's just a bit of practice. So everything is commercially available. I might come in there as well, because since you left, uh, a few people have used the semi-dynamic model. And it's not for the faint-hearted, mind you. So these big Excel spreadsheets, um, they need a bit of work. It takes a bit of time. You get used to it. Um, and my fallback plan is usually to uh, ring you if I have any questions. So if anybody wants to set up their um, semi-dynamic model in, in your lab, uh, don't hesitate to uh, contact the, the author so we, we can solve any problem. Okay, Isida? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Annabelle. Very nice uh, talk. And we have here some questions again in the in the chat. So the first one is if you use a different substrate uh, uh, protein enzyme ratio in the, in the intestinal phase, a uh, different pancreatin ratio in each gastric emptying aliquote. So all the final concentration of these components are the same as in the static protocol. So uh, for instance, in the bile concentration, we reach, uh, the aim is to reach 10 millimolar uh, of bile concentration. And it, the same applies for the concentration of the, or the activities of the enzymes. Yeah, then we have also again from George Van Aken some questions. If you think that it's possible then to include uh, feedback controls for the dynamic regulation of the gastric juice release. So it depends. So it's going to complicate the model, but. Yeah, well, I think that would be great because it's more, it will be more physiologically relevant for sure. But this model is aimed to be a simple model. And I think that will complicate and I'm not really sure how it can be done, to be honest. But I think the main aim of this model is to be accessible and simple. And I think we, we add more um, difficult uh, parameters like the sensing of the nutrients. I think that would complicate a lot uh, the model. Lotti, I don't know if you have yeah. some questions. So another question by Laszlo. He's asking if uh, the one can also study the kinetics by only assessing one uh, gastric sample. What do you think, Cannabel? Well, we recommend the, the selection of the number of gastric empty aliquots are, uh, you can select it, but we recommend a minimum of three to show kinetics. I mean, with one gastric empty aliquot, you cannot show any kinetics, so it will be like doing the static model. So yeah, we recommend a minimum of three. And another question is, uh, how would it be possible to use a normal pH meter instead of the pH meter uh, that is connected to a stat 
Yeah, so the, we provide two options. Uh, so we provide the option of the pH stat, which I think is quite useful because it combines the pH probe with the dosing device. But alternatively, you could use the pH probe and a syringe pump. Okay, so all, all questions uh, will be answered uh, either uh, in the next couple of minutes uh, in writing or afterwards via, via email. So thanks, thanks again, Annabelle, terrific talk, very nice work um, with a high impact, really a high international impact because you can share the, the methods and we have seen people start to use it now already. Uh, so I hand over to uh, Lottie uh, with another an announcement and then I'll finish uh, with one or two other announcements. Thanks again, both speakers, Annabelle and Gail. Yeah? Good. So uh, we, the work group one of the InfoChest uh, network would like to perform in the, this year two different ring trials. And I'm going to present you what we would like to do. And uh, if you are interested, please uh, contact me with the address below. So first of all, we would like to do a ring trial for the static uh, model, for the static protocol. And this is towards the goal of uh, publishing or of having uh, an international ISO standard for the static model. And this is within the da International Dairy Federation and that's why we are digesting dairy products. So in total, you would need to digest six different foods in triplicate, only the intestinal digestion at the end, and one, uh, yeah, it's only one time point. Then you would need to perform uh, an analysis of total nitrogen by Kildal. You would need to perform SDS page and do the protocol for free amine groups uh, with the OPA methods, which is provided in the draft of the ISO standard that you would get together with the, with all the other indications. And uh, then you would need just to send the results and also a digested samples to us because we will go on with other analytics on the digest. And this would be needed to be done until the end of June. Uh, so the, the digester and the, oh, your results, you need them more or less by August. So please, if you are interested, write me an email for the static ring trial. And the deadline for this registration is the 23rd of April. For the semi-dynamic model, here we only digest one food. Uh, we try to have it simple in the, in the first part. So it would be a skimmer powder that you would need to digest in triplicates. And doing five gastric time points. It's only meant for the gastric phase. You don't need to do an intestinal phase. SDS page, OPA assay. Again, you send the digested samples three stripe to Acroscope for further analysis. And uh, your results should be uh, ready by September. And then the goal is to discuss issues, problems, and do uh, or different other foods which needs to be discussed. So if you are interested in performing this ring trial, please also write me an email indicating semi-dynamic dynamic ring trial and also until 23rd of April. So that's it. Uh, if you have questions, just don't hesitate and write to me. Excellent. Thank you, Lottie. Um, so two ring trials, if you are interested in, you know, write to uh, uh, Lottie, so charlotte.egger at agroscope.admin.ch. Um, so it would be it would be a great if you if you can participate. Thank you both, Lottie and Isidra. And I have no, uh, I have a few more slides. A um, couple of pieces of news. So we are um, 
we were 155 attendants, live attendants uh, at the height. Now we are 120, a few people left already. And the only announcement really that I have is that uh, uh, next month on the 6th and 7th of May, we have the virtual, um, the virtual um, food digestion conference. Uh, so myself and Linda Giblin and uh, Natalie Lamar and all the uh, uh, other work group leaders, we have been busy um, selecting the talks. So uh, also to all talks have been selected now. We have uh, 29 talks, uh, 23 of which will be uh, by, um, um, by PhD students. And that was really the whole purpose of, uh, of this exercise to give PhD students their possibility to present their results. Uh, we have one live session from Australia and New Zealand, and that's on the uh, 7th of May in the morning. So at the bottom, I just say, um, uh, wrote a note, you need three logins. So if you're, it's like a Zoom webinar um, for the day one, you need to register for day one, you get a login. For day two, you get a separate login. And uh, my uh, smart PhD uh, postdocs here at Moorpark, um, they volunteered to run a poster session in the form of uh, uh, three minutes, did I say 30 minutes, of course, three minute uh, flash presentations. And that will be uh, on the evening of the uh, uh, first day, so May 6th. So we'll be uh, probably uh, starting at uh, seven o'clock uh, PM Irish time. Uh, we usually have the poster session around that time, usually with a glass of wine or a beer, you can do the same thing. So it's pretty, uh, pretty relaxed then. Okay, so watch watch that space. Um, just the last two two slides. Uh, we we have a present on LinkedIn and also on Twitter. So if you if you go to LinkedIn, you look for um, Infogest, you can uh, see the news, um, any any articles. If you want to po post any articles, just add at Infogest, not um, hashtag, but at Infogest. Um, if you want to join the network and get a, a regular newsletter please write to Nathalie Lamar or Didier uh, Dupont. Uh, the uh, news on the conference are also uh, published on LinkedIn. Um, all webinars will be uploaded onto our YouTube channel. So if you go to YouTube and look for in vitro food digestion or Infogest, eventually you'll find it. So this webinar will be uploaded within the next uh, couple of days really. So that's my last slide. So hope to see you uh, again on the 6th of May for our virtual conference. The, uh, the conference starts on 12 noon, that is Irish time. Uh, goodbye and slong.